Good evening and welcome to The Report with me, John Rees. In today's report, we look at human rights in Egypt as the Carter Centre announces it's to close its Cairo office. And we also examine whether drone strikes kill more innocents than combatants. The Bureau of Investigative Journalism has just released a report saying that just a fraction of those killed by drone strikes in Pakistan have been identified as members of al-Qaeda. But first, four men from London have been charged this morning with intending to commit acts of terrorism. This is the latest in an increasing number of anti-terror operations, according to Scotland Yard. Flamina Giambalvo has more on this story. A source from Scotland Yard has said that several plots this year to murder people on Britain's streets, directed or inspired by terrorism overseas, have already been disrupted with police activity to prevent attacks at its highest level for years. Scotland Yard Assistant Commissioner Mark Rowley said about 50 people a week are being referred to deradicalization programs. Other sources have said that police activity around stopping attacks has been at its highest since the aftermath of the 7-7 bombing on London's transport system. In a statement made this morning, Mr Rowley revealed that there have been over 200 terror-related arrests so far this year. The statement also said that there were 16 people who had been charged after returning from Syria. The document also revealed that there had been 100 Syria-related preventative activities each week. Other police activity includes work in mosques and work to encourage Muslim communities to inform the police about those who they have concerns about. The heightened police activities follow a month in which a number of high-ranking ministers have expressed their concerns about security issues in the country. Home Secretary Theresa May has recently proposed a tougher set of anti-terror regulations. These were widely supported by several of her party members, although a few had some reservations. Well, I have always believed that the uh, main way that you address security is at the same time as you must have the capability to match force with force, you need to recognize that the alleviation of poverty, of re reconciling deep resource constraints is terribly important because then you remove some of the reasons why people uh, wish to have uh, a forceful solution. So my, uh, my view has always been that we need to combine security with good governance and with poverty alleviation. The ongoing conflict in Iraq and Syria is bringing the UK alongside many other European states to raise security levels. But without addressing the underlying issues, many are concerned about how effective these measures will be. Well, joining me in the studio to discuss this is Kerry Bullivant, who's the media officer for the human rights group CAGE, and Margaret Gilmore, who's a research fellow at the Royal United Services Institute. Um, welcome to the programme, both of you. Um, Margaret, I mean, I don't think anybody can possibly have an argument with the, with the idea that people who are preparing to commit a crime uh, should be the proper subject of a police investigation, brought to trial, charged, and so forth and so on. But is there a worry with the, with the, with the current kind of politicisation of, of, of these of security issues that we're straying over a line from what people are doing to what they might be thinking. Um, you know, there's this whole question of it being illegal to swear an oath. That's what some of these people have been charged with that. Well, I suppose it's a starting point if um, they're swearing an oath of allegiance um, rather than to their own country but to a banned organisation. I don't think we're going to see people banned from um, having strong views. I don't think we're going to see people banned from holding demonstrations. We are a democracy. But uh, I do see um, a, a turn towards uh, what more can be done on the prevent side to stop these people, who the vast majority of Muslims want to be stopped, as well as everybody else, to stop them going out there um, under the mistaken idea that they're actually helping a cause when we all know that ISIS is actually killing more Muslims than anyone else and, and is very much part of the pro a huge part of the problem now. Mm. I mean, Kerry, do you, do you think that a, a legitimate um, police operation is now beginning to sort of spread into a, into a wider kind of uh, attempt to reshape politics ideologically? Well, the fact is that ever since 9-11 there's been a, a, an attempt to, to uh, force a version of Islam upon the Muslim community. That's been one of the main uh, objectives of, of Prevent. Um, and there's been a, a constant sort of um, open statements from the government about what is acceptable Islam and what is non-acceptable Islam. And we can see from... Uh, 
these sorts of issues like control orders and TPIMs that pre-crime has already been brought in where, look, you haven't committed a crime, but we think you're dangerous, so we're going to put you under restrictions. Um, we've seen the, the criminalization of, of books, um, as in the case of Maktaba, who were uh, um, held uh, and arrested and ev eventually won on appeal and, and released um, over the printing of books like Said Qutb's Milestones. Um, and so all of these sorts of thought crime things have been ongoing themes that have been continuous through the sort of war on terror. Um, and sadly, uh, as, as in the report, unless we start dealing with the, the actual causes uh, of the dissatisfaction and the things that radicalise people, all of these measures only seek to further criminalise and, and ostracise the Muslim community within Britain. But, but how much is um, extreme radicalisation to do with brainwashing anyway? Is that not what the problem that um, we're dealing with here is all about. It depends whether you're accepting that it's okay to be extreme to the point of thinking it's okay to behead women and um, men over in Syria and Iraq because you want their land and their home as well as the, obviously the hostages here. Is that okay? Is that not brainwashing? Uh, in which case coming and saying actually we just need to know where your priorities lie, which isn't as going as far as saying you don't have to think this, but just no action, is one way of identifying who may or may not be a threat. But the, the, the fact is that they, they're not even going as, as far as to say no action. They're moving into the realm where even um, thinking something can, can, can get you into trouble. So, for example, people who have, uh, have downloaded uh, materials without any intention of committing any ter terrorist act um, have been uh, convicted and, and, and sent to prison. Um, even the, the case of Rizwan Sabir, who, although the case was dropped, was uh, downloading materials for research purposes, ended up spending an extended amount of time in, in police custody. So we have to, obviously, no, yes. one, no, no one wants to see um, police officers shot on the, on, on the streets by in, in, in random uh, attacks and, and things like Woolwich. But the fact of the matter is we have to be careful that if the British government is seen to be laying out the boundaries of what is acceptable and what is not, then you're going to create more of a problem than you're going to solve. The fact is that the Muslim community has been very vocal on these issues. It has laid out its position very clearly. And I, I, I challenge anyone to, to point to any mosque in the country that, that supports or encourages these sorts of things. Yet the government seems to want to go further and further. And it's not because the, the Muslims and the community aren't doing enough. It's because the government needs to be seen to be tough on terrorism. Do you think, do you think, do you think that the, the, the spillover is... You see, when people talk about we've got to trace the causes back, I think everybody's sympathetic w with that. But then the, the debate starts with where you think the causes are. Is it that this... Imam said the wrong thing to this person or this person read the wrong book? Or is it that there are larger foreign policy issues at stake here, which is what the killers of Lee Rigby said, and that you get a, 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 a misguided and mistaken and brutal response to a wrong foreign policy? That's, that's the area of debate, isn't it? I, I have a real problem by uh, trying to go and blame some government when you've got a non-democratically elected group of people who get what they want by, by murder, by beheading, by using the internet to get that kind of message across. I, I absolutely see um, evidence uh, as never before that mainstream Muslims are absolutely doing what they can, are being more vocal than we have ever seen before, um, are saying what they can. Interesting that uh, those who've, who are worried about their young or their re relations going ever, over there are coming in greater numbers to the authorities to say, help me. I do agree with that. But as for the causes being blamed on a foreign policy, there may be a little bit of that. But we're talking a generation here, and somehow ISIS, this particular group of all the groups, and let's face it, they all morph in and out of each other, don't they, um, is somehow speaking to them in a language they know uh, through social media, which they understand, um, in short bursts, which is the way they want it. They don't want any longer the sort of one-hour speeches or what have you, and somehow getting through to not only those who maybe think there is something ideologically and justified religiously about going out there and setting up an Islamic State, but um, who um, maybe there are some who are going as adventure seekers, there are some who are sitting in London who, who want the violence and go out for criminal reasons. I mean, there must be all of that in the mix of people going out there. Do you, do you think that what happens, though, is that, you know, I mean, the, the, it's a perfectly coherent argument, but uh, there's a perfectly coherent argument that comes back to this. Okay, 
you know, beheading's bad. Nobody's going to say that it isn't. But, you know, the British, they're allied to the Saudis. The Saudis behead on a kind of industrial, uh, industrial scale. And, and what happens to them? Well, Prince Charles goes over and sells them some stuff from BAE. I mean, the, if you look to the causes of, of domestic terrorism, um, every single case, their um, aim and the, the reason behind it has been due to foreign policy. Um, Cage did research on this recently um, of all of the um, cases that, were, that happened in, U in the U UK where they were either successful or there was an identifiable plot. There were 66 people. Every single one of them uh, quoted foreign policy as the reason um, rather than a, a, a religious reason. Um, and so we have to, we, you can't divorce these two, these two aspects and these two issues. And it's largely the hypocrisy of uh, our stance with countries like Saudi Arabia, which have a horrible human rights record, have um, no democracy, and yet we are willing to pick and choose um, when we, we, we want to go in. Uh, Do you think that's what's happening? Mark, you, get, you get two mutually reinforcing yeah. polls. You get, you we, get, you we, get we, a kind we, of... We, we can have that argument, but who are they actually going out? Um, who, who are these young people? Whose foreign policy are they objecting to when they go out to Syria? The, the foreign policy of, of Britain allowing Assad to massacre his people. Because remember, the and mis now, but, but and now we've got think... ISIS massacring. Yeah. You yeah. know, our uh, people. Lot, it's a mess. It's a terrible yeah, mess. Yeah, and lots of people say, you know, that's that's what happened when you destroyed Iraq. Um, but 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 do you think do you think that one because one, one of the interesting things about the Syrian case is um, that um, as Mozambique found out um, that the government policy seemed to be suggesting that the rebels in Syria that were taking on Assad were a very good thing. Mm. Um, many people, I think, in the Muslim community reacted mostly in terms of humanitarian aid to that. Uh, some reacted in other ways as well. So that, that was a slightly that was a slightly different kind of correlation of forces. It in that became case. very difficult because um, the, those um, the Free Syrian Army, what have you, found themselves having to not own, being attacked not only by Assad but then by ISIS and and the other groups out there and having to fight on on two fronts and absolutely getting nowhere under total siege. So I th it's it's. It's so much more complicated than just saying it's all down but, to foreign policy. The, These people are going out there for different reasons to that. The, they can't the, all be saying it's what happened in Iraq. The, I'm afraid that okay. is going to be the oh, last, you word, the last word, No, no, no. <laughs> you've got the last word. You've had the last word. And I'm afraid we're going to have to end the discussion here. Not that we won't be returning to it, I'm sure, both with you and other guests. Um, I'd like to thank you both for taking part anyway. And um, I'm afraid now we're going to have to move on. Well, in some breaking news... Uh, <laughs>